Disc 47, Unseen Academicals By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 7x25 That someone who did not watch football was not a real personal person? He couldn't think of a proper answer. He was amazed that he had even asked the question. Things were changing. Glenda arrived in the night kitchen with Juliet sworn to silence, and beneficently gave Mildred and M.R.S. Hedges the rest of the night off. That suited them both very well, as it always does, and a little favor had been done there that she could call upon when necessary. She took her coat off and rolled up her sleeves. She felt at home in the night kitchen, in charge, in control. Behind black iron ranges she could defy the world. All right, she said to the subdued Juliet. We weren't there today. Today did not happen. You were here helping me clean the ovens. I'll see you get some overtime so your dad won't suspect. Okay? Have you got that? Yes, Glenda. And while we're here we'll make a start on the pies for tomorrow night. It'll be nice to get ahead of ourselves, right? Juliet said nothing. Say yes, Glenda, Glenda prompted. Yes, Glenda. Go and chop some pork, then. Being busy takes your mind off things, that's what I always say. Yes, Glenda, that's what you always say, said Juliet. An inflection caught Glenda's ear, and worried her a little. Do I always say that? When? Every day when you come in and put your apron on, Glenda. Mother used to say that, said Glenda, and tried to shake the thought out of her head. And she was right, of course. Hard work never hurt anybody. And she tried to unthink the treacherous thought. Except her. Pies, she thought. You can rely on pies. Pies don't give you grief. I think that Trev likes me, Juliet muttered. He don't give me funny looks like the other boys. He looks like a little puppy. You want to watch out for that look, my girl. I think I love him, Glendy. Wild boar, thought Glenda, and apricots. There's some left in the cool room. And we've got mutton pies with a choice of track clements, always popular. So, pork pies, I think, and there's some decent oysters in the pump room, so they'll do for the wet pie. I'll do sea pie and the anchovies look good, so there's always room for a stargazy or two, even though I feel sorry for the little fishes, but right now I'll bake some blind pastries so that what did you say? I love him. You can't. He saved my life. That's no basis for a relationship. A polite thank you would have sufficed. I've got a feeling about him. That's just silly. Well. Silly's not bad, is it? Now you listen to me, young-o, hello, Mr. Otomy. It is in the way of the Otomies all around the worlds to look as if they have been built out of the worst parts of two men and to be annoyingly hush and footed on thick red rubber soles, all the better to peep and pry and they always assume that a free cup of tea is theirs by right. What a day, miss, what a day. Were you at the match, he inquired, glancing from Glenda to Juliet. Been cleaning the ovens, said Glenda briskly. Yes, today didn't happen, Juliet added, and giggled. Glenda hated giggling. Otomy looked around slowly and without embarrassment, Noting the absence of dirt, discarded gloves, cloths, and we've only just finished getting everything all neat and tidy, Glenda snarled. Would you like a cup of tea, Mr. Otomy? And then you can tell us all about the game. It has been said that crowds are stupid, but mostly they are simply confused, since as an eyewitness the average person is as reliable as a meringue life jacket. It became obvious as Otomy went on, that nobody had any clear idea about anything other than that some bloke threw a goal from halfway down the street, and even then only maybe. But, 
Funny thing, Otomi went on, as Glenda metaphorically let out a breath, while we was in the shove, I could have sworn I saw your lovely assistant here chatting to a lad in the dimmer strip. No law against that. Glenda said. Anyway, she was here, cleaning the ovens. It was clumsy, but she hated people like him, who lived for the exercise of third-hand authority and loved every little bit of power they could grab. He'd seen more than he'd told her, that was certain, and wanted her to wriggle. And out of the corner of her mind, she could feel him looking at their coats. Their wet coats. I thought you didn't go to the football, Mr. Otomy. Ah, well, there you have it. The pointies wanted to go and watch a game, and me and Mr. Nobbs had to go with them in case they got breathed on by ordinary people. Blimey, you wouldn't believe it. Tutting and complaining and taking notes, like they owned the street. They're up to something, you mark my words. Glenda didn't like the word pointies, although it was a good description. Coming from Otomy, though, it was an invitation to greasy conspiracy. But however you baked it, wizards were knobs, people who mattered, the movers and the shakers. And when people like that got interested in the doings of people who by definition did not matter, little people were about to be shaken, and shook. Veterinary doesn't like football, she said. Well, of oh course, they're all in it together, said Otomi, tapping his nose. This caused a small lump of dried matter to shoot from his other nostril into his tea. Glenda had a brief struggle with her conscience over whether to point this out, but one. I thought you should know this on account of how people up in the sisters look up to you, said Otomi. I remember your mum. She was a saint, that woman. Always had a helping hand for everyone. Yes, and didn't they grab, said Glenda to herself. She was lucky to die with all her fingers. Otomi drained his mug and plunked it on the table with a sigh. Can't stand around here all day, eh? Yes. I'm sure you've got lots of other places to stand. Otomi paused at the entrance arch, and turned to grin at Juliet. A girl the spit an image of you, I'd swear it. With a dimmer boy. Amazing. You must have one of those double gangers. Well, it'll have to remain a mystery, as the man said when he found something that would have to remain a mystery. Tootle oh oh he stopped dead rather than walk into the silvery knife that Glenda was holding in a not totally threatening way quite close to his throat. She had the satisfaction of seeing his Adam's apple pop back up and down again like a sick yo-yo. Sorry about that, she said, lowering it. I've always got a knife in my hand these days. We've been doing the pork. Very much like human flesh, pork, or so they say. She put her spare hand across his shoulders and said, Probably not a good idea, spreading silly rumors, Mr. Otomy. You know how people can be so funny about that sort of thing. Nice of you to drop by and if you happen to be going past tomorrow I'll see that you get a pie. Do excuse us. I have a lot of chopping up to do. He left at speed. Glenda, her heart pounding looked at Juliet, her mouth made a perfect O. What? What? I fort you was goin' to stab I'm. I just happened to be holding a knife. You are holding a knife. We hold knives. This is a kitchen. Do you think he's goin' to tell? He doesn't really know anything. Eight inches, she thought. That's as big as you can make a pie without a dish. How many pies could I make out of a weasel like Otomy? The big mincer would make it easy. Rib cages and skulls must be a problem, though. Probably better, on the whole, to stick to pork. But the thought blazed away at the back of her mind, never to become action but unfamiliar, exciting and oddly liberating. What were the wizards doing at the game? Making notes about what? A puzzle to think about. 
In the meantime, they were in a world of pies. Juliet could work quite well at repetitive jobs when she put her mind to it, and she had a meticulousness often found in people who were not very clever. Occasionally she sniffed, not a good thing when you are making pie filling. She was probably thinking about Trev, and pasting him, in her beautiful and not very overcrowded head, into one of those glittery dreams sold by Bubble and other junk, where all you had to do to be famous was just be yourself. Ha! Huh. While Glenda had always known what she wanted. She worked long, poorly paid hours to get it, and here it was. Her own kitchen, and power, more or less, over pies. A moment ago you were daydreaming of turning a man into pies. Why are you so angry all the time? What went wrong? I'll tell you what went wrong. When you got there, there was no there there. You wanted to see Quirm from an open carriage while a nice young man drank champagne out of your slipper, but you never did, because they were a funny lot in Quirm, and you couldn't trust the water, and how did that champagne thing work, anyway? Didn't it drip out? What would happen if your toe trouble played up again? So you never did. Never will. I never said Trev's a bad lad, she said aloud. Not a gentleman, needs a slap to teach him manners and he takes life a good deal too easily, but he could make something of himself if he had reason to put his mind to it. Juliet did not seem to be listening, but you never could tell. It's just the football. You're on different sides. It won't work, Glenda finished. Supposing I went and supported the dimmers. A day ago that would have sounded like some kind of sacrilege, now it just presented a huge problem. For a start, your dad wouldn't speak to you ever again. Or your brothers. They don't now, much, anyway, except to ask when their grub is going to be ready. Do you know, today was the first time I ever saw the ball up close? And you know what? It weren't worth it. Hey, and they're going to have a fashion show on at Shatta tomorrow. Why don't we go? Never heard of it, Glenda snorted. It's a dwarf store. That sounds right. I can't imagine humans naming anything like that. You'd be hostage to the first misprint. We could go. Might be fun. Juliet waved a tattered copy of Bullet in Bubble. And the new micromails are going to be really good and soft, and don't chafe, it says here, plus, horned helmets are making a return after too long in OBS. Curry, T. Where's that? And there's this mat, in, a tomorrow. Yes, but we're not the kind of women who go to fashion shows, Jules. You're not. Why am I not? Well, because, well, I wouldn't know what to wear. Glenda was getting desperate now. That's why you should go to fashion shows, said Juliet smugly. Glenda opened her mouth to snap a reply, and thought. It's not about boys and it's not about football. It's safe. All right. I suppose it might be fun. Look, we've done a woman's job this evening. I'll take you home now and do my chores and come back. Your dad might be worrying. He'll be in the pub, said Juliet accurately. Well, he would be worrying if he wasn't, said Glenda. She wanted some time to herself with her feet up. It hadn't just been a long day, it had been a long and deep one as well. She needed some time for things to settle. And we'll take a chair, how about that? They're very expensive. Well, you're only young once, that's what I say. I never heard you say that before. Several troll chairs were waiting outside the university. They were expensive at five pence for the ride, but the seats in panniers round the carrier's neck were much more comfy than the slats on the buses. Of course, it was posh, and curtains twitched and lips pursed. 
That was the strange thing about the street. If you were born there, people didn't like it if you started not to fit in. Granny had called it getting ideas above your station. It was letting the side up. She opened Juliet's door for her because the girl always fumbled with the lock, and watched it shut. Only then did she open her own front door, which was as patched and peeling as the other one. She'd hardly taken her coat off when there was a hammering on the weather-beaten woodwork. She flung it open to find Mr. Stillup, Juliet's father, one fist still raised and a little cloud of powdered paint flecks settling around him. Heard you come in, Glendy, he said. What's this all about? His other huge hand rose, holding a crisp off-white envelope. You didn't see many of these in Dolly's sisters. It's called a letter, said Glenda. The man held it out imploringly and now she noticed the large letter V on the dreaded government stamp, guaranteed to spread fear and despondency among those with taxes yet to pay. It's his lordship writing to me, said Mr. Stillup in distress. Why'd he want to go and write to me? I haven't done nothing. Have you thought about opening it, said Glenda. That's generally how we find out what's in letters. There was another of those imploring looks. In Dolly's sister's reading and writing was soft indoor work that was best left to the women. Real work required broad backs, strong arms, and calloused hands. Mr. Stillup absolutely fitted the bill. He was captain of the Dollies and in one match had bitten an ear off three men. She sighed and took the letter from a hand which she noticed was slightly trembling and slid it open with her thumbnail. It says here, Mr. Stillup, she said, and the man winced. Yes. That would be you, Glenda added. Is there anything about taxes or anything, he said. Not that I can see. He writes that I would greatly appreciate your company at a dinner I am proposing to hold at Unseen University at 8 o'clock Wednesday evening to discuss the future of the famous game Foot the Ball. I will be pleased to welcome you as the captain of the Dolly Sisters team. Why has he picked on me? Stillup demanded. He says, said Glenda, because you're the captain. Yes, but why me? Maybe he's invited all the team captains, Glenda volunteered. You could send a lad round with a white scarf and check, couldn't you? Yeah, but supposing it's just me, said Stillup again, determined to plumb the horror to its depths. Glenda had a bright idea. Well then, Mr. Stillup, it would look like the captain of the Dolly sisters is the only one important enough to discuss the future of football with the ruler himself. Stillup didn't square his shoulders because he wore them permanently squared, but with a muscular nudge he managed to achieve the effect of cubed. Ha, he's got that one right, he roared. Glenda sighed inwardly. The man was strong, but his muscles were melting into fat. She knew his knees hurt. She knew he got out of breath rather quickly these days and in the presence of something he couldn't bully, punch, or kick, Mr. Stillup was entirely at a loss. Down by his sides his hands flexed and unflexed themselves as they tried to do his thinking for him. What's this all about? I don't know, Mr. Stillup. He shifted his weight. E.R. Would it be about that dimmer boy that got himself hurt today, do you think? Could be anyone, thought Glenda as cold dread blossomed. It's not as though it doesn't happen every week. It doesn't have to be either of them. It will be, of course, I know it, but I don't know it, can't possibly know it, and if I repeat that long enough it might all never have happened. Got himself hurt thought Glenda in the roar of panic. That quite likely means he happened to be standing in the wrong place in the wrong strip, which is tantamount to a self-inflicted wound. He got himself killed. My lads came in and said it was out in the street. That's what they just heard. He got killed, that's what they heard. They didn't see anything. That's right, they didn't see a thing. 
but they were doing a lot of listening. That one went over Stilop's head without even bothering to climb. And it was a dimmer boy. Yes, he said. They heard he died, but you know how those dim wool buggers lie. Where are your boys now? For a moment the old man's eyes blazed. They're stoppin' indoors or I'll thrash em. You get some nasty gangs out when something like that's been happening. One less now, then, said Glenda. Stilop's face was painted in pigments of misery and dread. They're not bad boys, you know. Not at heart. People pick on them. Yes, down at the watch house, she said to herself, where people say, that's them. The big ones. I'd know them anywhere. She left him shaking his head and ran down the road. The troll would never expect to get a fare up here and there was no sense in hanging around and getting covered in paint. She might just about be able to catch up with it on its way downtown. After a minute or two she realized that someone was following her. Chasing her in the gloom. If only she'd remembered to bring the knife. She stepped into a patch of deeper shadow and, as the knife-wielding maniac drew level, stepped out and shouted, Stop following me. Juliet gave a little scream. They've got Trev, she sobbed, as Glenda held her. I know they have. Don't be silly, said Glenda. There's fighting all the time after a big match. No sense in getting too worried. So why were you running? said Juliet sharply. And there was no answer to that. The blood low nodded him through the staff door with a grunt and he headed straight away for the vats. A couple of the lads were dribbling in their meticulous and very slow way, but there was no sign of nut until Trev risked his sanity and nasal passages by checking the communal sleeping area, where he found nut sleeping on his bedroll, clutching his stomach. It was an extremely large stomach. Given the usual neat shape of Nut, it made him look a little like a snake that had swallowed an extremely large goat. The curious face of the Igor and his worried voice came back to him. He looked down beside the bedroll and saw a small piece of pie crust and some crumbs. It smelled like a very good pie. In fact, he could think of only one person who could ever make a pie quite so beguiling. Whatever it was that had been filling Trev, the invisible illumination that had made him almost dance here from the watch house, drained out through his feet. He headed through the stone corridors to the night kitchen. Any optimism he might have retained was dashed one hope at a time by the trail of pie crumbs, but the illumination rose again as he saw Juliet and, oh yes, Glenda, standing in what was left of the night kitchen, which was a mess of torn open cupboards and pieces of pie crust. Oh. Mr. Trevor likely, said Glenda, folding her arms. Just one question. Who ate all the pies? The illumination swelled until it filled Trev with a kind of silvery light. It had been three nights since he had slept in an actual bed and it had not been your normal sort of day. He smiled broadly at nothing at all and was caught by Juliet as he hit the ground. Trev woke up half an hour later when Glenda brought him a cup of tea. I thought we'd better let you sleep, she said. Juliet said you looked awful, so obviously she's coming to her senses. He was dead, said Trev. Dead as a doorknob, and then he wasn't. What's that all about? He levered himself up and realized that he had been put to bed on one of the grubby bedrolls in the vats. Nut was lying on the roll next to him. All right, said Glenda. If you can do it without lying, tell me. She sat down and watched the sleeping nut for a while as Trev tried to make sense of the previous evening. What was in the sandwich again? The one the Igor gave him. Tuna, spaghetti, and jam. With sprinkles, said Trev, yawning. Are you sure? It's not the kind of thing you forget. What kind of jam? Glenda insisted. Why ask? I'm thinking it might work with quince. 
or chilly. Can't see any place for sprinkles, though. They don't make any sense. What? He's an Igor. It doesn't have to make sense. But he warned you about nut. Yes, but I don't think he meant lock up your pies, do you? Are you gonna get into trouble about the pies? No. I've got plenty more maturing in the cool room. They're at their best when matured. You have to keep ahead of yourself, with pies. She looked down at Nut and went on, Are you really telling me he got all smashed up by the Stilab boys and then walked out of the Lady Sybil? He was as dead as a doorknob. Even old Adok could spot that. This time they both stared at Nut. He's alive now, said Glenda, as if it was an accusation. Look, said Trev, all I know about people who come from Muberwald is that some of them are vampires and some are werewolves. Well, I don't think vampires are much interested in pies. And it was a full moon last week and he didn't act odd, well, odder than normal. Glenda lowered her voice. Maybe he's a zombie no, they don't eat pies either. She continued to stare at Nut, but another part of her said, there's going to be a banquet on Wednesday night. Lord Veterinary's up to something with the wizards. It's about the football, I'm sure of it. Well. For some plan, I expect. Something nasty. The wizards were at the game today taking notes. Don't tell me that's healthy. They want to shut down football, that's what it is. Good. Trevor Likely. How can you say that? Your dad died because he was dumb, said Trev. And don't tell me it was the way he would have wanted to go. No one would want to go like that. But he loved his football. So. What does that mean? The Stilop boys love their football. Andy Shank loves his football. And what does it mean? Not counting today. How often have you seen the ball in play? Hardly ever, I bet. Well, yes, but it's not about the football. You're saying that football is not about football. Glenda wished she'd had a proper education, or, failing that, any real education at all. But she was not going to back off now. It's the sharing, she said. It's being part of the crowd. It's chanting together. It's all of it. The whole thing. I believe, Miss Glenda, said Nut from his mattress, that the work you are looking for is Trous and Blurtster Selbst Überschritten Dirk Das Gans. They looked down at Nut again, mouths open. He had opened his eyes and appeared to be staring at the ceiling. It is the lonely soul trying to reach out to the shared soul of all humanity and possibly much further. W. E. G. Good night's translation of In Search of the Whole is marred, while quite understandable, by the mistranslation of Bihu a superscript to Saints Schwell as haircut throughout. Trev and Glenda looked at one another. Trev shrugged. Where could they start? Glenda coughed. Mr. Nutt, are you alive or dead or what? Alive, thank you very much for asking. I saw you killed. Trev shouted. We ran all the way to the Lady Sybil. Oh, said Nut. I am sorry, I do not recall. It would seem that diagnosis was an error. Am I right? They exchanged glances. Trev got the worst of it. When Glenda was angry, her glance might just possibly edge glass. But Nut had a point. It was hard to argue with a man who insisted that he was not dead. Um, and then you came back here and ate nine pies, said Glenda. Looks like they did you good, said Trev, with brittle cheerfulness. But I can't see where they've gone, Glenda finished. Belly busters, every one of them. You will be angry with me. Nut looked frightened. Let's all calm down, shall we, 
said Trev. Look, I was pretty worried, my oath, yes. Not angry, okay? We're your friends. I must be becoming. I must be helpful. This came from Nut's lips like a mantra. Glenda took his hands. Look, I'm not bothered about the pies, really I'm not. I like to see a man with a good appetite. But you must tell us what's wrong. Have you done something you shouldn't? I should be making myself worthy, Nut said, pulling away gently and not meeting her eyes. I must be becoming. I must not lie. I must gain worth. Thank you for your kindness. He got up, walked down the length of the vats, picked up a basket of candles, came back, wound up his dribbling machine and began to work, oblivious of their presence. Do you know what goes on in his head? Glenda whispered. When he was young, he was chained to an anvil for seven years, said Trev. What? That's terrible. Someone must have been very cruel to do something like that. Or desperate to make sure he didn't get free. Things are never all they seem, Mr. Trev, said Nut, without looking up from his feverish activity, and the acoustics in these cellars are very good. Your father loved you, did he not? What? Trev's face reddened. He loved you, took you to the football, shared a pie with you, taught you to cheer for the dimmers? Did he hold you on his shoulders so that you could see more of the game? Stop talking about my dad like that. Glenda took Trev's arm. It's okay, Trev, it's all right, it's not a nasty question. Really it isn't. But you hate him, because he became a mortal man, dying on the cobbles, said Nut, picking up another undribbled candle. That is nasty, said Glenda. Nut ignored her. He let you down, Mr. Trev. He wasn't the small boy's god. It turned out that he was only a man. But he was not only a man. Everyone who has ever watched a game in this city has heard of Dave Likely. If he was a fool, then any man who has ever climbed a mountain or swum a torrent is a fool. If he was a fool then so was the man who first tried to tame fire. If he was a fool then so was the man who tried the first oyster, he was a fool, too although I'm bound to remark that, given the division of labor in early hunter-gatherer cultures, he was probably a woman as well. Perhaps only a fool gets out of bed. But, after death, some fools shine like stars, and your father is such a one. After death, people forget the foolishness, but they do remember the shine. You could not have done anything. You could not have stopped him. If you could have stopped him he would not have been Dave Likely, a name that means football to thousands of people. Nut very carefully put down a beautifully dribbled candle and continued. Think about this, Mr. Trev. Don't be smart. Smart is only a polished version of dumb. Try intelligence. It will surely see you through. That's just a load of words, said Trev hotly, but Glenda saw the glistening lines down his cheeks. Please think about them, Mr. Trev, said Nut and added, there, I have done a complete basket. That is worth. It was the calmness. Nut had been spinning, almost sick with anxiety. He'd been repeating himself, as if he'd had to learn things for a teacher. And then he was otherwise totally reserved and collected. Glenda looked from Trev to Nut and back again. Trev's mouth hung open. She didn't blame it. What Nut had said with quiet matter-of-factness had sounded like not an opinion but the truth, winched out of some deep well. Then Trev broke the silence, speaking as if hypnotized, his voice hoarse. He gave me his old jersey when I was five. It was like a tent. I mean, it was so greasy I never got wet he stopped. After a moment Glenda pushed at his elbow. He's gone all stiff? 
she said, as stiff as a piece of wood. Ah, catatonic, said Nut. He is overwhelmed by his feelings. We should lay him down. These old mattresses they sleep on in here are rubbish, said Glenda, looking around for a better alternative to cold flagstones. I know the very thing, said Nut, suddenly all action and plunging off down the passage. This left Glenda still holding a rigid trev when Juliet appeared from the direction of the kitchens. She stopped instantly when she saw them, and burst into tears. He's dead, isn't he? E.R., no Glenda began. I talked to some of the bakery lads coming in to work and they're telling me there's been fights all over the city and someone got himself murdered. Trev's just had a bit of a shock, that's all. Mr. Nutt's gone to find something for him to lie down on. Oh. Juliet sounded a little disappointed, presumably because a bit of a shock was not sufficiently dramatic, but she rallied just as a loud, rough, and uniquely wooden noise from the other direction heralded Nutt pushing a large couch, which shuddered to a halt in front of them. There's a big room piled up with old furniture up the hall, he said, patting the faded velvet. It's a bit musty, but I think all the mice have fallen out on the way here. Quite a find actually. I believe it is a chaise long from the workshop of the famous Gurning Up Spire. I think I can probably restore it later. Let him down gently. What happened to him? said Juliet. Oh, the truth can be a little bit upsetting, said Nut. But he will get over it and feel better. I would very much like to know the truth myself, Mr. Nutt, thank you very much, said Glenda, folding her arms and trying to look stern while all the time a voice in her head was whispering Shays Long. Shays Long. When no one else is here you can have a go at languishing. It's a kind of medicine with words, said Nutt, carefully. Sometimes people fool themselves into believing things that aren't true. Sometimes that can be quite dangerous for the person. They see the world in a wrong way. They won't let themselves see that what they believe is wrong. But often there is a part of the mind that does know, and the right words can let it out. He gave them a worried look. Well, that's nice, said Juliet. It sounds like hocus pocus to me, said Glenda. Folk know their own minds. She folded her arms again, and saw Nut glance at them. Well, she demanded. Haven't you ever seen elbows before? Never such pretty dimpled ones, Miss Glenda, on such tightly folded arms. Up until that point Glenda had never realized that Juliet had such a dirty laugh, to which, Glenda fervently hoped, she was not entitled. Glenda's got a B.O. Glenda's got a bew. It's bow, actually, Glenda said, swiping to the back of her mind the recollection that it had taken her years to find that out herself. And I was just helping. We're helping him, aren't we, Mr. Nutt? Doesn't he look sweet lying there, said Juliet. All pink. She stroked Trev's greasy hair inexpertly. Just like a little boy. Yes, he's always been good at that, said Glenda. Why don't you go and get the little boy a cup of tea? And a biscuit. Not one of the chocolate ones. That'll take some time, she said as the girl shimmied away. She tends to get distracted. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.